Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm the head of the platform engineering team at Spring and Nature. I'm here with my colleague. I'm Simon. I'm a platform engineer in Daniel's team. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not working. Ah, now it is. So as said, we work for Spring and Nature. We're a large research publisher, one of the largest in the world. We're a global company with offices everywhere. We have about 13,000 employees, hundreds of developers. We have some well-known online platforms, such as Springlink, Biomed Central, Nature, Scientific America, just to name a few. Uh, the story, however, is not about publishing. Don't worry. It's quite generic, and I think it will apply to many of people here in the audience. So. Let's get started. Yeah, so it's basically a story about how we took deployments uh, from weeks to minutes, really, and how we prevented uh, a lot of uh, snowflakes. So to set the scene a little bit, I think it's good to go back in time. Um, the story begins when the company decides to bring in one of the biggest online platforms we had, Springlink. At that time, it was hosted. Um, by a third party, but also the, all the development was done by the third party support. And by bringing it in, um, we got quite a big challenge because not only had we uh, to do all the development, but of course also the operations and actually hosting the physical stuff. So yeah, quite a challenge. Yeah, so we decided to do this project uh, with agile methodologies, with how the thought works, and we used Scala, everything was super cool and awesome. Um, yeah, so the company realized we can do this in-house, so more projects started to pop up all over the globe. And this is great. Uh, unfortunately, though, the ops side of the business, i.e. us, had not at this point gone through the agile transformation, so we were kind of drowning. Wow. Yeah, so um, to paint the picture a little bit better of what it was like back then to go from an idea to production, we want to run a little scenario by you so you get a bit of an idea. So with any good project, where would you start, Simon? Write some code. Write some code. Cool. Um, what do you need? I uh, need to request a VM to put said code on. Yeah. Need some compute resources. Makes sense. And anything else? Uh, DNS for yes. the VM. Sure, I'm with you. Almost done. Can we uh, can NFS we to store random stuff on would be nice. NFS. NFS. Uh, OK. Um, ready to go live, or? Yeah, except for the firewall in between NFS and the VM, so I need to request a change there. OK, you need a firewall change. So you can just walk over to the guys, right, and request a change, and then we can get going. Uh, they're in a different country, so I just Taking a bit email. long? Yeah. All right. But now we're good, right? So it's working. You got the connection to the NFS. The app is live. Yes, mm -hmm. except for the public IP. Ah, yeah, people <laughs> can't reach it. So. I'm guessing you have to contact the guys in the Netherlands again. Yes, unfortunately. Okay. Yep. Nice. It's going to take quite long now, so I really want to push this thing live. OK, yeah. So we've done all this stuff manually up until now, so we need to do some configuration management. Configuration obviously. management. Uh -huh. Yeah, that makes sense. It's quite an important product. Uh, we expect a lot from it, so, but now we're good to go, right? Now we're good to go with nice. one VM. One VM. So we should probably think about nice. testing another VM. OK, I'm guessing you have to go through the whole shebang again. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we're finally live, I got some complaints. It's freaking oh. slow. So <laughs> maybe you can scale it up a bit. Yeah, if you give me some more hardware, that'd be cool. Uh, OK, so we need to order more hardware. That's probably going to take weeks. Yeah. No, this is not working, right? I think if we continue like this, we go mad. Um, so yeah, this clearly had some consequences. Uh, we saw a lot of frustration in the company, and uh, people started to work around these issues, and everywhere silos started to pop up. People created their own solutions. Lots of local optimizations, which result in duplicate systems. Uh, we saw graphites everywhere, Isingas, people monitoring the monitoring systems. One team was using Chef, and the other team was using Puppet. Then Ansible was the new kid on the block, so Ansible was overriding Puppet, and all kinds of fun. 
in the end, unreliable services. And what do you do? So I traveled quite a bit. Um, I went to uh, the various locations where we had our uh, development teams. And there were the um, ops guys embedded in the development teams. I met Simon. So we had many conversations, and we thought we can do this differently. Maybe it's time to bring all these ops people together and think a little bit more globally. Maybe we can provide them with one solution and deduplicate all of this mess. And that's when we created a new team, Platform Engineering. We, uh, we had a mission to make sure that people could release more often. We're going to fix all the mess, and we would be the new heroes in town. Nice. And we would make everything go faster, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we wanted to build something really reliable, scalable, and repeatable, kind of like the $6 billion infrastructure. So yeah, a short recap on that, I think. Uh, brought uh, in-house development from outsourced. Uh, super nice, but it uh, resulted in local optimization and silos, but the platform engineering team is formed. So that's nice. Sweet. But now what? Well, don't worry, because we have the platform engineering team, and we knew exactly what to do. We knew, of course, what the people wanted. So we went into the cave, had a meeting in Berlin, spent three days with each other. Uh, we listed out all the issues that we knew that were there and came up with lots of solutions. I think that was pretty awesome, right? Yeah, it was super cool. As Daniel mentioned earlier, we came from different locations, from different development streams. So we knew where all the pain points were for both us ops people and for the developers. So we knew where to focus. And clearly what we needed was faster horses. Faster horses. Obviously. It's stupid to wait you know, days for v VM. And it's stupid to wait DNS changes for days. Uh, we had crappy um, configuration management. So we wanted to fix that. So it's going to be super flexible and awesome. Uh, so we went into the cave again and started to walk, and it was going pretty well. Yeah, we came up with some pretty good solutions until uh, microservices. What? Yeah, yep. people started talking about microservices, and uh, we knew we were in uh, for some uh, new trouble. All this nice configuration management and all this nice automation uh, would have been nice with a couple of monoliths, but. When you uh, start thinking about microservices and things going to explode into 200, 300, or even more little services, that's obviously not going to work. So we were on the wrong path, and we needed to rethink our strategy. So uh, we went back, got together, and we decided to do things a little bit differently this time around. Yeah, so instead of going into the cave, this time we went out of it uh, to talk to the people uh, that we were supposed to help. Um, turned out they don't really care about VMs and configuration management and other cool stuff. Um, they only really cared about they running all, code. Yeah, they just want to run their code, right? Yeah, wanted to take their application and put it in production as smooth as possible, basically. So we asked them, is it a pass you want? And they were like, yeah, pass we want. <laughs> So this is where Cloud Foundry enters the picture, right? Knight in shining armor. Knight in the shining armor. Uh, so we started to uh, play around with the different pass uh, systems that were out there, um, like DIN and uh, Flynn and Days and all these cool Docker-based ones, and OpenShift from Red Hat, and obviously Cloud Foundry. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it was pretty clear from the beginning that they all more or less uh, wanted cloud, yeah? something we didn't have. Our APIs was emails and phone calls. Um, yeah, so that was a bummer for all of them besides Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry obviously has Bosch, which is super amazing. And you can do all the multi cloud uh, buzzwordy stuff with that, which was super nice because we could actually deploy Cloud Foundry in an actual data center where the actual applications would be running, which is important, right? When you come from a kind of old time uh, infrastructure, um, the application starts to take a uh, weird shape, right, where they require m uh, millisecond latency to SAP and other back office systems and databases. So going public wasn't really an op option for us. Yeah. So I think after all the spiking, we were pretty confident that Cloud Foundry was the way to go for us. We, um, we created this series of internal presentations, made a business case, 
We got all the people aligned. Everyone was excited. So we got the green light. We were ordering the hardware with the ops teams, wrecking it. We are deploying Cloud Foundry. It was fantastic, right? Um, no one was using it. So we built this platform. We thought, yes, we're on the right track. But it turns out no one was pushing any apps. It's just basic, a, basically a big dust collector. Um, well, I think there was a couple of things missing. Um, so the developers had a lack of trust in the platform. Is it production ready? And also a lack of knowledge. How, do, how does it work? Um, but more importantly, I think uh, the problem was that there was business as usual. Developers, as you know, are paid to deliver features. And there was some work to be done at the code to refactor it and make it cloud native so it runs in the platform. Um, so we know uh, we had to do something, so we started uh, selling. Yeah. We, of course, use it internally for our cool stuff. Uh, but we wanna un wanna want other people to use it as well, of course. So we started recording videos and sending send them out through the company. And we started using subliminal messaging. So every time we would get a request for help, we would be like, OK, we will help you. But Cloud Foundry in the corner is pretty darn awesome. You should try it out. And at some point, we just stopped uh, helping people and were like, no. <laughs> Use Cloud Foundry for your dashboard. Come on. Yeah. And it, it worked. We got yeah. some initial adoption. People were happy to put the uh, non-business critical stuff in there. Yeah, we got some small traction. But then our little micro friends come in to save the day, um, where before we thought we were in trouble. Now we were ready. Um, no coincidence that one of our biggest uh, open access platforms uh, was going to be re rebuilt from scratch. They're going to do it completely uh, with uh, microservices. And together, we decided to deploy it on Cloud Foundry from day zero. And it was really good. They got so much uh, improvement, fast feedback. They were able to push to production without any dependencies to ops teams. And this inspired other teams to also look at their monoliths and starting to peel off little things and bits and pieces. So yeah, we got some initial traction. So we started off with the uh, faster horses, which was clearly wrong. Decided to listen. Um, doing some research, we uh, came up with Cloud Foundry. Uh, then we started selling it. And we got some initial adoption. It's good. But it's not yet great. Yeah, so obviously with new tech, uh, new problems arise. So yeah, Cloud Foundry, super awesome. You can push really quickly, which also means you can push snowflakes really quickly into production. Uh, so we saw this quite quickly, where new teams would pick up the product, right, Cloud Foundry, and start building their own automation around how to use the platform, how to do their own zero downtime deployment, rollbacks, all this kind of jazz. Uh, there were also problems for people because they didn't really know how do you get logs out of this, how do you get metrics out of this, how do I monitor my applications inside Cloud Foundry. So we solved that. Uh, we got uh, all the tech leads together from different departments and uh, discussed, like, how are you using the platform? What are some kind of generic traits you share? And um, we created something we uh, call the Springer App Anatomy. It's basically uh, the 12-factor app with some extra constraints around it. Uh, so today, you can more or less clone a repo in any language of choice or um, uh, framework of choice and be really up to speed in minutes yeah. with a new project, which is cool. We also did some stuff ourselves, right? Yeah, so we, uh, we started generating pipelines for people. Um, we started giving monitoring for free. So part of the app anatomy states that your application must expose an endpoint. Said endpoint must uh, have a JSON document describing how the application should be monitored and who should be contacted in case something goes wrong. Uh, we started generating dashboards. Um, logging. Logging. Yeah, big EOK stack, logging for free. Also some nice stuff. Yeah, that was all good. So um, that's a little bit where we are today. So we just want to run some numbers by you uh, so you get a bit of a feeling what we do. Uh, so currently, um, in our stack, uh, we do about 700 deployments in 24 hours to development and production. We run about 1,400 apps, which uh, together do 3,000 3, requests per second. And it's all global traffic. It's all nice, but the real cool thing is that it has a very small footprint if you compare it to where we come from. It's just a few physical boxes spread across two data centers. Uh, it's a very generic implementation. 
And yeah, only three, two to three people have to maintain the stuff. Um, that would have been impossible, I think, if you look at this uh, comparison. Yeah, uh, I won't rehash the numbers, but as you can see, faster horses kind of sucks compared to Cloud Foundry. Uh, <laughs> everything is really nice. Uh, we can support whatever we want in Cloud Foundry. You know, you can use any language you want. How we try to do that with that faster horses approach, we would have uh, ended up with some pretty gnarly configuration management. Uh, but the real benefit, I guess, I think, is the fact that we can just destroy our Cloud Foundry environment and bring it up again really quickly, and we can. Uh, you know, respond to security uh, threats really quickly. So we yeah. just patch everything without developers even knowing it. Um, yeah, thanks to Bosch. Thanks, Bosch. Everything is groovy in Cloud Foundry land. Yeah. Uh, something else I want to mention is that we, uh, we did CF from scratch. So we basically used the community release directly upstream, um, which I think is quite cool for a large company, as Spring and Nature is, that we have all our uh, mission critical uh, business applications on top of community software, supported directly by our own people and relying on the support from the community. I think it's a big change, and I'm really proud of it, so that's quite cool. And open source has more benefits for us, right? Yeah, for me, uh, it's really cool, right, to be able to look at the code and the issue trackers and be part of the community, you know, through mailing list or Slack. It's like, yeah, it's proper open source, which is super cool. Um, and of course, being part of the community means that we can contribute back, which we've done. You know, submitted pull requests here and there, open source projects. They're all on GitHub if you want to check them out. Yeah, that's good. So the whole uh, journey uh, has learned us a lot. We made loads of mistakes. I mentioned a few, but there, trust me, there are more. Um, the biggest, I think, takeaway is that um, everything uh, revolves around trust. We couldn't have done this, I think, if we hadn't put the trust and the power in the hands of the engineers. Uh, so I think it's really important that you start to build trust first before you start building systems. And just um, from a grassroots movement, you can, yeah, you can basically change the way the development and operations works together. Um, I think if you get all of these things right, you can really go from weeks to minutes instead of having yeah, horrible big monoliths that's deployed maybe once every twice, once a week, you know, with lots of local optimization and snowflakes all over the place. You can have nice... To something that's more appropriate for 2016. Lots of small apps deployed all the time, global standards, so it doesn't matter if you're in Pune or New York or London or Berlin, you develop and deploy exactly the same. And yeah, you can do this all from a grassroots movement. So at no, no point in time did any CEO or CTO come from us because they read something, some cool pamphlet in CTO Weekly or whatever. We did this from the ground up, truly, which is pretty nice. Yeah. So to give a little bit of an impression what it's like today, if you have an idea and you want to go into, into production, where would I start with my idea? Write some code. Write some code. And I did some work. I think I need a VM, right? No, you just type CF push. All right. Uh, maybe I need some DNS? Nah, you're right. Uh, no? That's handled by the platform. All right. No requests needed. But I definitely need some storage, right? Some NFS for my state? Sure, but if you stop relying on NFS, you will have a much better time. Just use object storage or database or whatever makes sense. OK, that's cool. Um, but I want my app to be available, so there's probably some firewall involved. No, you just bind your application to a specific domain, and you're online on the internet. It's cool. That's awesome. Did you use a lot of configuration management to get this done? Or? No, not really. None. It just works, you know. Cool, cool. So this is great, right? I have my app. I did, didn't need anyone. I was live. But now I need to scale it. So now we're probably in trouble, right? Now you type CF scale. So if you don't have RSI, it's fine. OK. <laughs> That's awesome. And if we have more hardware, you just Yeah, we rack it, and we add it, and push the button, and Everything's good. Impressive. Yeah. I would say that's pretty uh, badass. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's um, our story, how we went from weeks to minutes. And thank you all for listening. <laughs> I want to thank my wife for the slides. She's probably watching at home, so thank you.